it's, this is actually quite a big week. Modi is, of course, kicking it off. Trump is going to wrap it all up. We've had the Brazilian leader, the Italian leader, Macron, Merkel, everyone is here. And I have to introduce Lee Howell out here, who's, you know, everyone says Klaus Schwab has absolutely built the World Economic Forum, and 100% he has, but he's had a really, really powerful team that's helped him doing it, and none more so than Lee Howell's, of course, been a great friend of India's as well for a long period of time. So it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to have you with us on the show right now, Lee. And it's also good to get a Davos newbie, first time in for Kavan, for Kavan Mittal, who's, of course, heads an Indian unicorn hike. So uh, we heard the Prime Minister talking a lot about how the, what the new era is, so it's great to have you with us. Lee, first of all, I mean, you had a date now to digest the Prime Minister's speech. Uh, you, I know you have tried very hard to get an Indian Prime Minister to Davos for, what's it, 15 years you've been trying? You know, absolutely. And it's you been, finally yeah, managed absolutely. it. <laughs> Worth the wait? Absolutely. I mean, the theme, as you know, this year is a shared vision in a fractured world. And I think, um, maybe not in Asia, but in the rest of the world, um, I mean, there was real concern about how can we get uh, democracies to function and actually how can we make the market function along with it. And to have the, uh, you know, the leader of the largest democracy in the world and, uh, you know, and, and, and arguably the fastest growing economy in the G G20 here, and, and is, I, think, uh, I think made us sort of rethink a bit that of what's possible. Um, at the same time, uh, it also is a good moment to, to make people understand um, different perspective on global issues um, from Asia, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, you, you, I mean, you'll tough cover this, I'm sure, but I mean, he spoke about globalization. He spoke about climate, uh, data. So I think this was also very exciting that uh, it wasn't just about what's happening in India, but really about the Indian perspective on what they think, uh, what the people, the government thinks is important. But, but I'm also sort of curious, did you get any people sort of raising eyebrows? Because you've had, you have just about every world leader here this week, other than the Chinese Premier. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, I'm going to get to in a right. couple of minutes. But from Angela Merkel to the head of, you know, of Brazil, right. Italy, you know, Canada, you name it. So the decision to give Narendra Modi the opening plenary, was that a big call? No, again, it's, again it, to, to us, it's pretty simple. Biggest democracy in the world, fastest growing economy. And if you think about the future, think about my children's generation, India will have a major role to play in their future. Right, that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. You're already having some people contrasting what Narendra Modi said about climate change and about protectionism and wondering whether that's sort of some sort of a tussle between him and Trump out there and uh, sending a clear signal right. to, the, to, to Donald Trump and the Americans who have a slightly different take on it. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's fair to say is that when we spoke of a unipolar world, we thought of the United States, but everyone's sharing the same norms and, and goals. And we said if we shift to a multipolar world, it's basically the same norms and goals, but just different, uh, uh, so, you know, sort of a shift of where the power would lie or the influence would lie. You know, Professor Schwab in his opening remarks mentioned this notion of a multi-conceptual world. And I do think there are competing views, you know, competing narratives really about how the world's going to evolve and what the fate of the planet's going to be. And this is the place where those competing narratives, I think it's important for all stakeholders to sort of start out and, and, and maybe in a way voice where, where they're going to put their support. So are you a bit surprised that for two years now you've had India and China coming here and saying we must do something about climate change and we must encourage globalization, which is the position that normally the United States would take. And this, I mean, we're not quite sure right. what Trump is going to say, but I'm sure, sure. you're waiting with bated breath to see what he'll, what he'll come up with. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you're talking about the two, you know, the biggest countries in the world, right? Populations over one billion people. I mean, I think they should be heard and, and listened to uh, because they're going to be a big part of the solution. Now, I think the problem we have are that there are parts of the world that were sort of speaking in unison and there's you know this notion of a fractured world that even if you take North America uh, what is happening with the fate of NAFTA possibly or even in the European Union you know what's their is where do where are their where's their shared interest now going forward um, so I think that's what really sets the context of the importance of why we had the okay. Prime Minister here all right, come and let me get you in as a Davos, you know, newbie. Has it lived up to, your, to what you've often heard about, I'm sure, uh, other than the cold and the snow, and you brought record snowfall with you this year? Yeah, I think the experience has been great. Of course, it's, it's fantastic to be here and be invited. Um, we have a massive Indian delegation that's come with Prime Minister Modi, who's been, I think, the first Prime Minister in almost 20 years now, which is a big deal. And coming back to just his speech and all the stuff that he talked about, it was, it was nice to hear... A, a global theme on all the issues, not only things that we've been talking about before, but forward-looking new issues like big data and so on. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's you know, we now spend at least four or five hours on our smartphones every day. That's, a, that's time that's been carved out of the day. 
So a lot of your self-worth, your you know, a lot of that sits in the cloud. And what do you do about that too? So that's very good to hear and touch upon uh, from the Prime Minister. So that's actually one of the reasons why I thought it would be really great to talk to both you and Lee uh, in this particular uh, uh, moment. Is Lee, you and the World Economic Forum have really been pushing very strongly, very hard on the fourth industrial revolution. It's something that Klaus also believes and he's written two books now. You know, I don't know how many other tracks he's written on it. Um, you clearly believe this is the way the world is headed, right? Artificial intelligence, data, digital, biotech. We are, we are the cusp of massive revolutionary changes. Well, like his generation is going to be... Absolutely. You know, Mrs. Merkel just an hour ago gave a speech. And in that speech, just like the Prime Minister uh, mentioned, uh, the data. Data is really the currency of the future. Now, what she articulated, though, is quite different. And also, actually, it, 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 it jives very close to what the Prime Minister said. Then the question is who owns that data, who controls it. In the case of Europe, many they don't have the companies uh, that really uh, are able to, to leverage that data, so they do have a dilemma there. Uh, he, uh, she mentioned that in, in, in China, there's a very close relationship between those companies and the state. What's the model here? Because we know that the, in the importance of data in this new economy. Now, to your point out technology, we believe, yes, the future is technology-driven, but it must be human-centered. This technology, now you, I think you really, Kevin, it has to serve us, it has to serve everyone. Right. You're a technology company, so are you human-centric? And is that, are you, are you excited by all the stuff you're hearing here at the forum about the fourth industrial revolution and the fact we need to really spend more time than we do right now thinking about where technology is leading us? Absolutely. Like, absolutely. I just heard Noah, Noah Harari, which is of course an absolute privilege to hear him, talking about the fact that whoever owns biometric data, for example, probably is going to shape the future of the human species. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, talking about the fourth industrial revolution, it's just a much deeper understanding of ourselves and the world around us. And how do you use that to augment our lives and make it better? So when you, th when you talk about AI and, and biotech and so on, a lot of that is, is human-centered. How do we sort of, you know, improve the lives of human beings? How do we augment our lives as, as human beings? Or augment well, ourselves as human beings, which is also a possibility. Yes. Perhaps yes. even a probability. Most likely. The question is when, not if. And all, behind all of this is data, um, as Lee mentioned. So the big question... What's, what's interesting is at a global scale, you'll have a hun hundreds of companies doing this and companies that are going to be um, located in different countries. Technically speaking, those companies that become very big end up owning that data and that country also has that data too. So it's a very interesting topic to discuss because yeah. you know, in the technology space, the world is one. Right. So, so actually, there's one word that I think is really dominating Davos this year. It is data and, and, and the questions around it. So that's one word so far. Another word is about to dominate Davos, and which is Trump. So, you know, what are you looking forward to in that particular speech? Well, I think what we you need to reframe Would it. Would you like, like to see drama? Would you like to see... Uh, I, you know, what less... I'd like to see is to know this is, you know, an economy. It's 25% of global GDP, arguably still the, the greatest military power on the planet. I think we all, all of us, the big all, curious to know really what are the priorities. If it is uh, the, the idea of what is this ex notion of America first, how does it play out in the global order? Um, what parts of the system, you know, is, is it going to reinforce and what parts is it going to try to look to change? Um, so I'm like everyone else. I, I think it's a great opportunity to be in listening mode here. To be in listening mode. What would you be looking forward to in the Trump speech? You know, it's, it's interesting. It's so contrasting to what Prime Minister spoke about. So it's interesting to have two bookends that may likely end up being in from very different perspectives. And that's going to be very interesting. Well, who knows? Donald Trump could come out here and say that I've changed my mind. I'm actually believe in Paris. I'm going to do something about climate change. And if so, that'll be great. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for that.